Good morning from those of us with Vigilant Fire and EMS training in CypherWorks Incorporated. We want to welcome you to our eight week webinar series, Managing Your Fire Service Training. We appreciate you for joining us for this informative work workshop. Each week we'll provide some training on a different aspect of managing your fire service program. After each week, you're gonna receive an email with a certificate. Please keep those for your professional development records. Please use the chat function if you have any questions or need anything as we'll be monitoring the chat. And at this time, I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Todd Smith who will be leading the training. Todd is the CEO and founder of Vigilant Fire Service Training. He has 28 years of fire service experience and is a certified New York State Municipal of Fire Instructor. Thanks a lot, Todd. Take it away. Thank you, Chris. And I want to welcome everybody this morning to another presentation of Managing the Fire Service Training Program. And today we're going to dive into what it takes to manage a fire service training program. And we're going to really focus in on the methodology and curriculum development that needs to happen uh, to develop your program to the next step. Uh, so when we're talking about the fire service training program, uh, it, it's one of the most time consuming uh, management requirements we have uh, in the entire fire service. Uh, outside of the fire chief, the training officer really has the most amount of uh, uh, responsibility on his or her shoulders. And, and that sometimes can weigh real heavy on a fire department itself. Have you ever gone to your fire station for drill night and you've heard the term, what are we doing for drill? Or you've shown up to drill and not known what was gonna happen for that training session. If you've ever heard this, you might be working in a training program that isn't quite being managed as effectively or as efficiently as it possibly could. And that is because managing that fire service training program is the most time consuming task in the fire service. It truly, truly is. Let's take a look here at just a couple of things that the, the, the training officer or the lead fire instructor of the organization has to handle and take care of on an annual basis. Well, first off, they have to identify some training requirements. We have to figure out what training is required uh, and what training the fire department or the organization itself has to conduct. They have to identify the skill level of their people. They have to understand the skills that they need to be taught and what level of, of skill function they currently have. And if they're going to do that, they need to develop a process to assess that skill because we, how do we figure out what skill level is everybody at? Is it objective or subjective? Well, it should be objective if we're going to truly identify skill level and help build that skill level. And then we've got to identify what training is needed to make that skill improve or improve the confidence in the people who are performing the skills. And then we got to develop a plan to meet the retraining requirements that are outside of just the skill needs of the fire service or the fire department itself. There's also requirements that come, on, come to us from external sources, such as state requirements and federal requirements. Then we have to develop a schedule of all those training sessions that need to be conducted where we're going to put together uh, all that training in, in a session to deliver the stuff that's required and develop those skills. And for every session that we go through, we're gonna to have to develop a lesson for each session. If we're gonna develop a lesson and present something, we need to also present, build the presentation for that lesson itself, okay? And then we need to deliver each one of those training sessions to a captive audience, which might be one of the hardest parts uh, of the entire training service management program or management of the training service program is getting that captive audience to sit down in front of an instructor on a weekly basis and listen to the curriculum as it's being delivered. And once we've conducted this training, we have to record each training session and then we got to maintain a record of those uh, training sessions that we completed. So as you can see, this is quite an intense list of things that the fire instructor is responsible for. So how do we put this all together? How do we take all of these things that the fire, uh, 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 the fire instructor, lead fire instructor, or whoever's managing the, the fire service training program, the training officer, how do we take all of those things, put them into something that's manageable? Well, it's the same way we eat an elephant. We eat it one bite at a time. So what we do for managing the fire service training program that we teach is we break each step down into a process. So we take this whole huge process of managing this huge program and breaking it down into little itty bitty parts that are a lot easier to chew, bite off, and take care of one step at a time. And that's always going to begin with a needs assessment. Okay, so the first thing we have to do is perform a needs assessment to see what training actually needs to be done. And then we're going to develop that into a program. 
And that program is going to be able to take all of the needs, put it together into a one basic function under one curriculum and deliver that to the people. And that's how we operate the program under a certain methodology. So we take the needs, we develop it into a curriculum, and then we operate the program using a methodology that delivers the training to our members in a logical sequence. And then not only do we have to evaluate the firefighters that we're training, but we also have to evaluate the program that we're delivering. We want to make sure that that program is delivering the, the train, not just meeting the training requirements, but it's also meeting the skill development requirement and it's meeting the knowledge requirement of our organization as a whole. And then there's a whole retention of records and record retention uh, uh, program that needs to be conducted to make sure that everything is being uh, kept properly and disposed of properly. So we break it down into these five different steps and look at each step one at a time. That's what we'll do now. We'll start out with the needs assessment and understand uh, how we perform a needs assessment in, in our own, for our own organization. There's two different parts to it. One is internal and the other is external. And we've kind of alluded to this so far this morning, but let's dive a little bit deeper and we'll start out with that external. So the external training requirement is a requirement that comes to us from outside of our organization itself. What would that be? <coughs> Excuse me. It could be laws such as federal, state, and local laws that require specific training. Uh, we have standards that comes to us from the Occupation Safety and Health Administration. It also comes to us through our professional standards, uh, the National Fire Protection Agency. <coughs> Excuse me, got a cough this morning. All right, and then we have our mandates. And the mandates are, 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 um, are things that close the gap between laws and standards. And those are our sexual harassment training, our workplace violence training, and uh, things like bloodborne pathogens. Now, our internal needs assessment. <clears throat> These are our organizational needs. This is where we, uh, we, we find out what training our organization itself needs, okay? Uh, how do we figure out that? Well, we can fall back on the OSHA Fire Brigade Standard, 29 CFR 1910-156. And in that, it basically tells us that we can develop an organizational statement. And that organizational statement basically says who you are, what does your organization do, what is the number of your membership, and what is your leadership hierarchy? <coughs> In that statement, we're going to identify what it is that we do. What functions does the fire department or this organization perform? What services are provided? And then that statement's also going to list how you prepare. So what type of training do you do? What is the frequency of your training? And what is the amount of that training when you are, are performing it? So we look at this organizational statement. We basically put together a statement that says exactly who we are, what we do and how we do it. And inside of that statement lies our internal training requirement needs. So for a structural firefighting organization, if we respond to structure fires, <coughs> then we have, to, we have to train our firefighters in fire suppression. We have to train them how to handle hoses, how to manage a water stream, where to place the water stream, how to advance that hose line, how to get water from the fire hydrant to the fire engine, to the hose, to the application of the seat of the fire. We also have to train those firefighters on tactical ventilation techniques, how to uh, remove bad air from the building while introducing fresh air. And we also have to train our firefighters on how to perform search and rescue techniques, how to remove victims from a building. So if we're a structural firefighting outfit, this is what we do. This is what our needs assessment looks like. We have identified internal needs within our organization that mean we have to teach our firefighters how to handle hose, how to wear uh, uh, our SCBA and PPE properly, and how to use ground ladders, perform rescue techniques, and perform uh, ventilation. <coughs> the same holds true now if we are an organization that also does auto extrication. If we respond to motor vehicle accidents, and provide a service of auto extrication, then we need to train our firefighters in auto extrication. So now we've identified a whole other list of needs, uh, internal needs, that we have to teach our firefighters. We have to teach them both knowledge and skill of everything that we do on the fire ground. What does our hazardous materials 
uh, response look like? Are we an agency that responds at the awareness level, that uh, responds to a motor vehicle accident, and notices that there's a spill and says, yes, there's a spill, we need to bring somebody in to take care of the spill? Or are we an operations level where we respond to a motor vehicle accident and say, hey, there's a spill, and we put some speedy dry on or maybe um, uh, a little bit of plugging and diking? Or are we a technical uh, uh, operations response team where we actually go in, put on hazmat suits, go into an IDLH, uh, mitigate a hazardous material situation. What level we perform and what level we provide to the community is the level at which we need to be trained at. So that identifies a whole need in itself. It's just to what level of hazardous materials response is our organization? What are we prepared to handle? The same holds true for our technical rescue aspects. So water rescue, rope rescue, ice rescue, trench rescue, collapse rescue, and so on. Just because you have water flowing through your fire district does not mean that you have to have a rescue team. But should you choose to perform water rescue and purchase water rescue equipment and respond to incidents where people have called 911 because somebody's in the water, then you have to train your firefighters commensurate to that duty of entering the water, using an RDC to remove a victim, so on and so forth. Whatever level we expect our firefighters to respond at is the training level that we need to train them to. This holds true for rapid intervention. So if, you, if your organization responds as a rapid intervention crew to a neighboring fire district, then your firefighters need to be trained in rapid intervention. Same would hold true for a Marine unit. If your fire department has a Marine unit, then your firefighters who operate the Marine unit have to be trained on the Marine unit just as they would be trained on an engine or ladder company. So I think you've seen the moral of the story here is if your fire department chooses to respond to a certain type of an incident or they provide a certain service, then firefighters have to be trained in both the knowledge and skill of that service before performing that service. And that moves us up into program development. So what is it that we actually have to teach our firefighters? So we have to develop a training program to provide training that's identified in that needs assessment, okay, uh, to all the members of the organization who are expected to do certain jobs. So it, it basically comes down to job description. What is that member's job description? So if your fire department has several different types of jobs, maybe you have firefighters who are only in the support level, maybe they fill air packs, uh, respond to rehab situations, then those firefighters, their job description is support level, and they are taking care of people who are uh, actually operating inside of the fire building, but they're doing this from an external position that's out in the warm zone. Those are called job descriptions, and we have to develop these job descriptions to meet the needs of the organization. If your organization does not have that membership role where somebody can just be a support member, then you don't need to create a job description for that. But if your fire department is a structural uh, firefighting fire department and you respond to structure fires, then you need to create a job description for an interior structural firefighter. And what that job description does is it's developed to each position of the fire department. So if you have a fire chief, you need to have a job description for the fire chief. If you have fire captains who are uh, in between the firefighters and the fire chief, then a job description should be written for them. If you have firefighters who just perform auto extrication, then you need to write job descriptions for the firefighters who are performing auto extrication. The same would hold true for any specialty, including hazmat or technical rescue. So job descriptions will, <clears throat> are based on the performance level that we're, or the job we're expecting the firefighter to do, and what we're identifying is a job performance requirement within those job descriptions. So if I have a structural firefighter, I expect that firefighter is going to be able to carry, throw, raise, and climb a ground ladder. So that would be a job performance requirement. Job performance requirements, they're required for a specific job. Uh, the specific job that we just described there is, is an operation of a ground ladder. What we do with our JPRs, these job performance requirements, is we group them according to tactic and task. So we have identified exactly what it is that the fire department is doing. We describe or we create job positions to do the things we want them to do. 
And then with inside of those job descriptions, we identify job performance requirements or the skills that they need to perform that job description in the duty of the service that the fire organization provides. So JPRs define the skill that each firefighter must be capable of to perform that duty. And again, the duty that you're requiring these firefighters to perform is described in that job description. And we base JPRs on skills that are identified through the National Fire Protection Agency uh, Professional Standard for Firefighter 1 and 2, which is NFPA 1001. So all of our skills come from that professional standard uh, that's described in NFPA 1001. So when we develop one of these uh, job performance requirements, we're just gonna use the ladder skill uh, as an example for this, this course. Uh, what we do is we develop job performance requirements for each little individual skill that the firefighter is going to have to perform according to their own job description. So we title these according to the skill or the category that they're going to be forming the skill in. So here you can see the one that we have here is a core ladder skill. So this job performance requirement is LAD LAD 1. So it's, it's the number one in the series. And it's the core ladder skill. It is referenced by that aforementioned NFPA 1001. So here, the reference here becomes NFPA 1001. It's chapter 4, 3.6. So if we open up NFPA 1001 and we go to chapter 4, under section 3, line 6 is going to give us exactly what the firefighter needs to do. Uh, it's going to give us their skill and knowledge ability to be able to operate a ladder. So what we've done is we've taken that skill portion of what NFPA 1001 does and turned it into a JPR where we provide a description and a procedure for showing competency in that given skill. So what our description does is our description describes exactly what the firefighter has to do. And that description tells us exactly, the tool, exactly what tools we're gonna give the firefighter it tells us exactly how the firefighter is going to perform the uh, operation. And it tells us exactly to what degree the firefighter is going to have to be able to complete uh, these skills to show that, that he or her has proficiency in the operation. So the description here is the firefighter is going to be given a 24-foot extension ladder, and they're going to demonstrate the skill performance of ground ladder operations listed below, which we'll get to in the procedure with a 100% proficiency according to NFPA 1001 4.3.6. So what we're doing here is we're identifying the professionally accepted standard, which is the NFPA standard 1001 for Firefighter 1. Chapter 4 of that, Section 3, describes what skills the firefighter must be able to perform in his or her duties as a firefighter while operating a ground ladder. So we reference it back to the NFPA skill because what we don't want to be doing here is telling people what skills we think they should be doing. The second we start saying is uh, fire administrators or fire officers or fire service leadership, the second we start saying you should do this, excuse me, <coughs> we become subjective and not objective. Remaining inside of NFPA 1001 always keeps us objective. <coughs> Terrible tickles. So now, it's my fall allergies crushing me. <coughs> now we get to the procedure level of this, okay? So in the procedure, we're listing exactly what skills we want to see the firefighter do. And in this case, we want to see a single firefighter, high shoulder, ladder lift. We want to see a high shoulder carry. <coughs> and we also want to see a high shoulder raise. So these are all skills that we would have taught our firefighter through the training process. And now we're making sure that they actually have the skill performance and the knowledge requirement to perform the skill through the GPR. So where do they get that skill level? Where do we get that knowledge level? That comes from our curriculum. And the way we develop curriculum is we develop lessons to deliver the knowledge and skill presentation for each individual job performance requirement. We develop delivery methods to present each one of those lessons, and that delivery method is going to vary depending on what lesson we're trying to teach. 
These methods are always going to be based on knowledge and skill requirement. So NFPA 1001 tells us both the knowledge and skill requirement for every topic we're going to be teaching. We simply take those knowledge and skill requirements and develop the best method for delivering that training to our firefighters. With the entire process being based on our job description and job performance requirements. Now we have several different delivery methods. First and foremost, we have training and drilling. And often what happens here is we'll hear people use these two words interchangeably, okay? Uh, and they are two completely different things. And it becomes very important for us uh, as fire instructors and fire service leaders to understand that training and drilling are two completely different things. Training, training is the formal method of introducing a new skill or knowledge, okay? So it's where we, we physically sit down our firefighters in a controlled environment, um, usually in front of a TV screen or maybe in front of a PowerPoint presentation, and we deliver something very formal to them, very formal operation. Drilling, on the other hand, is when we get to practice that new knowledge or skill. So drilling probably takes place on the training ground as opposed to the classroom where the training is taking place. So drilling takes place on the training ground, training takes place on or in the classroom. When we get out to the drilling ground, this is where we practice that new skill that we introduce through the formal method of training. It becomes very important and we break these into two individual steps because we want to show the firefighter what right looks like before we have them start performing whatever skill that, they're, that we're trying to teach. The idea here is that they understand what it is to perform the skill or the knowledge level correctly before they even attempt to perform it themselves. Now, there are other delivery methods that we can use for both training and drilling. When we're talking about training, we often use lecture, discussion, and presentation. And when we use, uh, or when we're drilling with or teaching skills, we most often use demonstration or a video, okay? So in that lecture or discussion, it's an instructor led. It's what we're doing right now. So I'm sitting here and I am lecturing to you because you have no way of communicating back with me. So I'm basically, you're at my will of how fast I'm gonna go with this death by PowerPoint or uh, how, how slow I'm going to go. And you really can't have any interaction with me at this point. You can text back and forth and put a little message up and maybe Chris will tell me that we have a question. But for the most part, you have to listen to me, lecture and go over this uh, presentation here. Different than a discussion, okay? So a discussion is great because what a discussion does is it allows the instructor to understand the knowledge of the student and it also allows the student to perform a feedback loop. Uh, where we can, we can get knowledge back from the, the student to see what they're picking up, what they're not picking up. And then presentations are also great, and they're widely used in the fire service. And typically, we're seeing those, uh, those PowerPoint uh, deliveries. And that's where we're trying to deliver knowledge, we're trying to teach them something new. A uh, great example here would be, maybe we're going to talk about modern fire behavior. Okay, we're going to go through a PowerPoint, and that PowerPoint's going to hit all the bullet points of describing the definitions of fire behavior. And maybe we're gonna throw in a couple of pictures and maybe a couple of videos of what fire development looks like. Okay, great for delivering new knowledge. When we move to the demonstration, or we're gonna to move to a skill, we're gonna demonstrate that skill. We're gonna show what the skill looks like. We're gonna do that either with a demonstration, a live demonstration that's happening on the training grounds, or maybe through a video where we're showing the student, again, what right looks like. And we can't stress the importance of teaching somebody uh, first through showing what right looks like. And this is where I always stray more to the video side than from the demonstration side. And here's the reason for that. One of the problems when we demonstrate skills is if I have a firefighter who's picked up bad habits or maybe skipped several steps, or maybe they're... Uh, a more senior, more developed firefighter that is better uh, at, at performing this skill, and they've done it a thousand times, they might miss the little small nuances or the little easy small steps that turn into something big later. So they might be skipping something or even showing something uh, incorrectly. And that's something that we have happened quite a bit, because once we show somebody how to do something incorrectly, 
the way that they now know it is to do it incorrectly. And then when they go to teach it to the next person, they teach it incorrectly. And that chain of events continues until we have an entire organization full of people who are throwing ladders upside down, for example. Now that's an extreme, but it's possible. But what happens now is if we had a video to show the student what that skill looks like when it's performed correctly, the video is consistent. That video stays consistent from the first time I showed it to the first group of people to the last time I showed it to the group 10 or the 10th, excuse me, the 10th group of people that I've showed it to. The video was the same all the way through. And the video can also be the same this year as it was last year, as it was the year before that, and the same it will be the following year. Okay, so that's a demonstration and video of that new skill. Lean towards the video. So what does that mean? That means that maybe we need to take some time and get a couple of firefighters together who are uh, performing these skills correctly. And often the best thing to do here is to take some new firefighters who just got done with proby school and film them performing these skills. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. Okay. And then we have our skill drills. <coughs> so once we've taught the skill, we've shown them what right looks like and they put their hands on it for the first time. Now they can start to practice that skill. And we practice the skill until we can apply the skill in an evolution or a scenario, okay? So two uh, other delivery methods for, uh, for getting the firefighter now out of the classroom and onto the training grounds where they're actually getting their hands on. So during that skill drill, we're gonna be practicing that specific skill requirement. We're gonna be practicing right out of the JPR. So they're going to be practicing the skills in the way that we're teaching them directly from the book, so to speak. OK, and then they get they get time to practice that skill. And through that, they develop their own muscle memory. And this is so critical and it's something that's missed a lot when we're teaching young firefighters new skill drills. Today's training requirements are so massive. If we look at a, a, a firefighter one or two class uh, these, the hours that are being put into these, these classes are tremendous because we're trying to throw a ton of knowledge and skill uh, to these new firefighters that are coming through. And what we lose during that is we don't spend enough time throwing ladders or using a Halligan bar or applying a hose streak. Okay. So what we, we learn a lot of different skills, a lot of different skill sets, and we're introduced to those skill sets. But really, at our firefighter one and two level training, we're not really developing the muscle memory of those skills. And what I mean by muscle memory is muscle memory is the ability to do something time and time again without having to think about it. OK, uh, so in your own mind, think about the last time you went to work, uh, especially now with the time change. Um, you know, it's a little bit dark. It, well, it was darker in the morning. You're driving to work. Have you ever got to work and said, oh. Did I stop at that stop sign at such and such? Okay. You have to ask yourself that because you've driven to work so many times that you don't even really think about driving to work anymore. Your drive to work now becomes a time when you're thinking about different things. You're thinking about the most recent problems that are going on. You're thinking about the things that happened yesterday at work and how you're going to have to fix those things today. But the first time that you drove to work, your sole consideration was on how to get to work because you had to understand exactly what turn was left, what turn was right, what exit you were getting on at, what exit you were getting off at, what parking lot to enter when you got to your workplace. You had to think about all those things. But after several months of working at the same location, that trip now goes becomes muscle memory and you don't have to think about it as much. That's what we're trying to develop when we're developing skills as far as firefighting uh, uh, skills is concerned. I'll give you another quick story about muscle memory and how, uh, how, how crazy muscle memory can be. Uh, last summer, I was making some uh, uh, bubbles for my, my kids. I have two young children and I was making bubbles for them. And bubbles is simply, you take some water and you mix it with uh, um, some uh, Dawn soap. And there's another uh, ingredient that, that I can't think of right now. Uh, but regardless, it, basically you're using soap and water to make this uh, solution that they can blow on and it turns into a bubble. Well, in the process of making this, I made a mess of my hands. I got soap all over my hands. So I have to clean my hands. So I walked to the kitchen sink to clean my hands. And the first thing I did when I got to the sink was I put soap on my hands from the soap container at the sink. 
Now I'm washing soap off of my hands, but the first thing that I did was put more soap on my hands. Why did I do that? I did that because I had developed muscle memory of washing my hands so many times using a procedure that walked to the sink, dispensed soap onto my hands, rubbed my hands together, turned the water on, rinsed my hands, turned the water off, dry my hands. I went through that procedure so many times that when I wash my hands now, I don't think about doing those things. I immediately do those things without thinking about it. My mind can think about something else. So I had soap on my hand, walked up and still put soap on my hand because I was thinking about something else. My mind wasn't engaged in the actual performance of the skill. That becomes important in firefighting because what we want firefighters to be able to do is perform the skill without thinking about it so that their focus can be on the victim hanging out of the window or the wire that's overhanging the, uh, the, the, the same entrance way where they're trying to place a ladder. We want the firefighter's mind to be on the situation and understanding what's happening around them at that given time and not trying to worry about whether or not I foot the ladder against the building or if I foot the ladder into gravel or how I throw this high shoulder or suitcase carry. We want that to be muscle memory. We want that to happen naturally so that their focus can be on their situational awareness. All right, that's exactly what we're trying to do. And then once we've developed that muscle memory, what we do is we apply that skill into an evolution, okay? So uh, this is where we go into a controlled environment, such as a training ground or maybe an acquired structure, and we're going to apply that new skill or knowledge into an actual evolution. Let's fall back on the latter uh, example again. So we've taught our firefighters all the parts of a ladder. We taught them to, to, through, the, through training. We taught them how to be safe with the ladder. We then showed them how to properly put a ladder up and how to properly climb a ladder. We then allowed them to practice putting up a ladder and climbing a ladder. Our next step now is we're going to apply that to an actual fire ground scenario. So we're going to take them and have them perform a vent enter search operation where they have to enter the second floor via a ground ladder to perform a search. Now, part of this evolution is carrying a ground ladder, raising a ground ladder, and climbing a ground ladder. We're combining that with the other skills that we've taught them in the same method that we've taught the ladders, because we've taught them search and victim removal techniques in the same method that we taught the ladder operation. But we're taking those three skill sets and applying them to the same evolution, okay? <coughs> so how do we get this to them? How do we get this skill and knowledge and, and, and get it to our firefighters? Well, we have to do that through developing our own curriculum or using somebody's curriculum that has been developed. So either method will work. And if you're new to this, then trying to create your own curriculum can get very cumbersome. But there are many different uh, companies that are out there that provide uh, firefighter training curriculum. Regardless of how that happens, at the base of all of this curriculum is our lesson plan. And we'll just go over a lesson plan real quick so you can understand the components and parts of a lesson plan. And we're gonna use that basic ground ladder skill again so that we're, we're using the same scenario or the same idea through all of this. So what we're looking at here on the screen is a cover sheet, okay? So this is what's called the lesson plan cover sheet. And the idea of the lesson plan cover sheet is that the fire instructor, the person who's gonna be teaching this drill can take one look at one page and understand completely uh, what's going on uh, in that drill, okay? They're gonna understand exactly what skills are gonna be taught, what the firefighter is gonna get out of that training, they'll have an idea of what they're gonna need for this training, how long the training is gonna be, uh, what time of year to have the training, so on and so forth. The cover sheet is like a box score to a baseball game. It can tell you everything in one quick glance as to what's going on with this. So the whole thing starts out up here, at the top with the, basically the demographics. And I'm just gonna go over these little by uh, one by one just so that everybody can understand uh, what goes into uh, curriculum development. And you get a better understanding of how curriculum works in fire service training, okay? So it starts off with our category. And our category is ground ladders. Our categories were come, are gonna come from basically our external need requirements. We'll identify our categories through what does NFP require us to train on? Or if you're in OSHA state, what does OSHA require us to train on? Or maybe it's at the state level where the state has said, you have to train your firefighters on such and such topic, such and such topic, this topic, and that topic. 
and they have to have so many hours in that topic. Depending on what that, what they're asking you to do is going to be your category. Now within that category is the topic itself. So this lesson is giving a ground ladder lesson. That's our category because it's gonna be counted as ground ladder time. The topic though is basic ground ladder skill, which means that we're going to get down to the basics and understand the skill of operating the ground ladder, okay? The lesson type, here we can have a cognitive lesson or a psychomotor lesson. Cognitive simply means that knowledge presentation that I was talking about, and psychomotor simply means the skill lesson that I was talking about. In this case, it's going to be a skill lesson or a psychomotor. What is our lesson method? Well, that's what we just got done talking about, all those different ways we can deliver a method or deliver a lesson, excuse me. So in this lesson, we're going to be delivering a skill demonstration. The last update on this lesson was in April of 2019. So what kind of lesson are we talking about? What is the level? What is the level of our, our, our lesson? And this level tells us that it's a basic. It could have been an introduction, a basic, intermediate, or advanced, and it's a basic. And then we have this one, two, and three. So what this is, this tells us, this tells us the, what type of lesson it's going to be as far as is it, are we going to learn knowledge? Are we going to retain um, uh, a skill? Or are we going to have to do um, some form of uh, interpretation? And this being a two means that we're going to retain some skill level at that. We can talk a little bit deeper about the levels one, two, and three of, of cognitive learning uh, in a different webinar. But we don't really have to understand uh, the basis of that. You just need to understand that basically we're getting cognitive lesson or we're going to be doing some skill work, or we're going to be able to do a function like command where we can uh, be given a scenario and come up with an idea of what we need to do. Okay, so what are we gonna need for facility? This can be done in a truck bay, or it can be done on an apparatus uh, apron. Um, up here, the course title, so what course is this for? This is for our annual service training. It's not really for a course, but it's part of our annual training that we're gonna continue to do. Uh, how long is your setup time gonna be? It's gonna be about 10 minutes. It's gonna take you about 30 minutes to perform the lesson and skill time is gonna be about another 30 minutes. So we're looking at about an hour uh, time uh, on the training ground itself. And the prerequisites, so this lesson is written for New York State and we have our prerequisite is New York State Basic Exterior Firefighter Operations, also known as BFO. Now our next, Thing that we run into here is all of our instructor needs. So what's the instructor going to need uh, to do this training? So teaching aids that the instructor is going to need. The instructor is going to need a whiteboard, some markers, props. They're going to need fire service ground ladders of varying length. Uh, student material. So what is the student going to have to bring? They're going to need PPE, helmet, foot protection at minimum. Okay, so they need PPE, uh, is their helmet, gloves, and foot protection as a minimum. What are the SOPs or SOGs or best practices that relate to this training? And here you can see it's New York State Best Practice 4.1 uh, eight, uh, line 18, which basically uh, is the New York State Best Practices for Fire Service Training Program identifies uh, the need to teach ground ladders. And that's in chapter four, section one, line 18, where we're getting that from. References is exactly what we stated before. It's NFPA 1001, chapter four, all right? Line three, uh, chapter four, section three, line six. And then safety consideration, uh, overhead hazards, lifting techniques, proper lighting of the drill grounds. So those things you're gonna have to take care of before we, we allow our students to perform these skills on the training ground. And then what can they do for continued education? This is a skill that must be practiced and drilled on consistently. This is not something they can just do once and be proficient at it. So we want our students to go walk away with this. We want to show them how to, how, to, how to practice this skill is what we're trying to teach them here. Then we get into the training goal. The training goal uh, gives you exactly what the goal of the entire overall training looks like. Okay, So what do we want to get out of this training? The terminal objective is what the student's going to take away from the actual lesson. It's the, so if we're talking about learning, we're talking about a, a, a change in behavior. So the terminal objective is going to identify that change in behavior. And we use the ABCD method of writing uh, objectives where A is the audience, B is the behavior that they're gonna change, C is the condition under which 
uh, they're going to change that behavior. And D is the degree to which they will change that. And whenever we're talking about skills, that degree is always 100%. Because we're not ever going to be satisfied with somebody who can only do a skill at 70%. Now our enabling objectives support the terminal objective. The terminal objective is the big thing that the, the student's gonna walk away with. Enabling objectives are the little things we're gonna teach them, just like we broke this down into five steps. Uh, we're gonna break the, this drill down into six different steps that they're gonna be able to perform to get the big overall picture of that terminal objective. And then the overview walks the instructor through what the drill is going to do, how to conduct a drill and what's gonna happen during the drill. So just from this cover sheet, just from this curriculum training lesson, the instructor knows exactly what's going to happen at that training session. Now, when I get into the meat and potatoes of the actual lesson, a training lesson plan, the components are five different parts. They're preparation, presentation, application, evaluation, and summary. So there's five different parts of that lesson plan. During the preparation part, it's how we introduce the topic to the student, not necessarily how we prepare the instructor. The instructor understands his or her preparation from the cover sheet. They understand what they have to do to prepare for this lesson according to the cover sheet. But in the preparation part of the lesson, and as we're presenting this lesson, we're, pre we're preparing the student to learn, okay? This is like an icebreaker. This is where we break the ice with the student, maybe tell a joke, uh, work them into something, tell maybe uh, a NIOSH report, something, but something prepares the student for learn, learning. And then we get into the meat of the actual lesson itself, and that's where we do the presentation. So for this lesson, what's happening is they're having a review of the parts of a ground ladder. They're going to go over the parts and terminology. They're going to go over the types of ladders that we carry on the apparatus, okay? And then they're going to uh, uh, go over each one of those ladders and talk about uh, the, the different parts of the ladder and how much the, each part weighs, how much the ladder weighs itself, what we use the ladder for, so on and so forth. The lesson then continues from a presentation into an application, and that's where we would start uh, uh, demonstrating the skill, what the skill looks like when it's done correctly, and then starting to teach those kids uh, the skill uh, performance part of it, and then allowing them to get their hands on the actual ladder for the first time. And then we're going to evaluate that, what that, what that looks like, how well are they doing. And remember, it's 100% of the skill is what we're looking for. And we're evaluating that not subjectively, but objectively against the JPR that we've created, that job performance requirement for operating ground ladders. And then once we're satisfied with that, we've coached them through, and they're proficient enough in this portion of the skill to move on to the next portion, we, con we conclude the entire lesson with a summary of the key important parts. And we always close our lessons out with a summary. So that is program curriculum development. Now, when we talk about program operation, all we're doing is we're taking that uh, program and we're turning it into a methodology. We're going to deliver it through a methodology. We have to have a method for delivering all of our curriculum. And what we use is something called proficiency cycle training. It's a cycle that builds competency within those skills uh, and it starts always with training, where we deliver uh, what right looks like in that formal setting, and it ends with mastery. So in that training session, this is where we introduce that new topic, concept, or skill. It's that formal presentation that we talked about. We start every, uh, every, every single skill or knowledge that we're going to do begins with that training session. We then move into the drilling portion of it, and that's where we're going to perform the skill. We're given that concept and we're going to allow them repetitive practice. We're going to teach that skill using something called the five-step psychomotor process. And this is a five-step process that's been developed to help students understand and develop their skills quickly. Okay. The way we start this out is we, we perform the skill for the student at full speed. So the instructor performs the skill at full speed, does not say a word about the skill. We're showing what right looks like here. And again, we could use a video presentation for that. The next step is the instructor is going to perform the skill at half speed and explain each step as they performing the skill. The third step is now the instructor is going to perform the, the, the skill at half speed again, but this time the student is going to explain what each step is. And then fourth, finally, the student's going to get to perform the skill at half speed while they explain each step. 
The final step in this process is the student continues to practice and perform that skill until they can do it at full speed. And while they're practicing the skill, this is where the instructor is, 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 is actually a coach. We're gonna allow the student to, to perform the skill. We're even gonna allow the student to fail. The only time we're gonna stop the student is, is for a safety measure once we get to step five. So the first step, we show them what the skill looks like. Second step, we show them slowly, tell them what each step is. Third step, we perform it again slowly while they tell us what the skill is. The fourth step is they do the skill at half speed and explain each step. And then five, finally, they practice the skill. Now, once they've practiced the skill and they've practiced a bunch of different skills together, we bring them together to apply that skill in an evolution. So this is where they apply that concept of the new skill uh, or even maybe the new knowledge concept. And this is gonna happen in a controlled environment in a simulation type format. Now, while that evolution is being performed, we're going to evaluate that skill level, okay? We're going to assess that new skill or concept in a company competency. So instead of looking at each individual and checking them off on those JPRs that we did when we were talking about individual skills, we're now gonna look at how they're performing as a company and how they're performing this overall task as an entire company. Once we've identified something in that, whether it was good or maybe it was bad, if it's a deficiency that we identified, then we're gonna have some remediation training. So we're gonna develop a plan to remediate them for whatever skill that they kind of goofed up with. And once that remediation training starts, we start the cycle all over again, where we give them some training. We then allow them to practice it. We give them an application and an evolution. We evaluate that evolution and then we remediate training again. And this, this continues until we develop mastery. And once mastery of skill happens, that means we have now completed the process of developing the muscle memory of the skill within the firefighter. And one of two things happens. We move on to a new skill or we move on to the next part of that skill. If this was an SCBA that we were talking about, then we got them finally to be able to turn the SCBA on, put it on, wear it within two minutes, and they can wear it down and understand their vibe alert. The next step now is maybe we teach them the skill of SCBA emergency. So removing themselves from their SCBA or doing a low profile. In the case of a ground ladder, maybe we've taught them how to suitcase carry, raise the ladder using the, the butt end of the ladder against the building. And now once they've mastered that, we kick it up a notch and teach them how to high shoulder carry the ladder and then high shoulder raise the ladder in the same format. Okay. So now operating the program, the way we do that is we take all those lessons and we develop them into an annual training plan, okay? And that plan is gonna use the proficiency cycle to deliver the curriculum. And we're gonna use a logical sequence to deliver that curriculum in manageable little blocks. Some training might need to be done weekly while other training can be done every couple of weeks. Some training may be monthly while others we can get away with quarterly and even annually. And the trick to this is, is the skills that are really critical need to be performed weekly. <coughs> the skills that really aren't critical, but maybe they're mandated by the state for us to train are stuff that we can touch on annually. And most other things will fall in somewhere in the middle of that. But we need to develop a program and develop an annual training plan that meets those needs and requirements. Okay, So once we develop it, uh, develop the plan, we create a session schedule, and we break each topic down on that session schedule, and we begin each different topic with one of those training presentations that's a, in a formal setting. We follow that up with a skill drill where we teach the actual skill of it, and then we apply that skill in an evolution. And testing comes during those evolutions while we're looking at the overall company as a whole. Okay. Now, the next part of this is we have to evaluate our own selves. We have to evaluate how our program is actually operating. How well is our program working? The program has to be evaluated just as firefighters are because we have to understand exactly how effective this program is. Is our, are our firefighters increasing in knowledge and scalability or are they lacking in some knowledge or scalability? We identify that through our own program evaluation. And we want to evaluate everything and evaluate our lesson plans, our presentations, and even our instructors. It's important that we're developing our instructors and assigning our instructors to the correct topics, okay? We might have firefighters who are really strong in ground ladders, but are not very strong in auto extrication. 
We don't want those firefighters teaching auto extrication. We want them focused on ground ladders. Uh, and most of this, everything that we're talking about can be managed with the pre and post test. And it doesn't have to be a hundred word uh, multi-choice question. There are many different ways that we can uh, talk about uh, uh, testing our firefighters and most of them in very fun ways, especially with our younger generation being more electronically uh, adept uh, in, in, in stuff we can do in a setting where they don't even understand that they're being tested. But we're getting good feedback back. In our future webinars, we'll talk a little bit more about stuff that we can use for those solutions. Now, the last part of this is record retention. The last part of the training program is record retention because unrecorded training did not happen, okay? Individual training sessions must be recorded with what's called a training report. And this training report goes through everything that we talked about in that lesson plan. The training report looks just like a lesson plan, but instead of where the topic uh, presentation would be, we have a uh, attendance sheet. So we want each individual's name to be on that attendance sheet and it shows exactly what we did for that training. And then every individual member also has to have their own permanent record of their own training completions. And that's their, their initial training as well as their on-the-job training and any external training that they've taken uh, beyond uh, uh, that. Okay, and all training records must be maintained and destroyed according to state regulations. So each individual state has their own regulation as to how to retain the records. They're called their uh, uh, re uh, record retention schedules is what most states call them. And they have uh, the list out the exact record that needs to be maintained, how long it needs to be maintained for, and how to actually destroy or dispose of that record once it no longer needs to be uh, maintained. But record retention is critically important. And so important, we're gonna dedicate an entire webinar uh, in the future here just to record retention. So we covered a lot of stuff, uh, but we broke it down into those little parts. But remember, when we're managing that fire service training program, it all starts with a needs assessment, okay? We have to figure out what exactly it is that the organization needs for training. And that's required training from external sources, as well as needed training from internal sources as to what, uh, what training you need according to what services you provide. We then develop a program and develop curriculum and a methodology for delivery of that, uh, uh, the needs that were identified in the training requirement. And then we put it all into a program and operate the program in a logical sequence that allows our firefighters to retain the knowledge that we're teaching them and allows them time to develop the skills we're trying to instill in them. And then we need to evaluate the program to make sure that the firefighters are learning and retaining those skills uh, on an annual or biannual basis. And we need to maintain records of everything that we've done, of all the other four steps. And we need to hold those records until the state says we can get rid of them. And when we do get rid of them, we need to destroy them or dispose of them in the way that the state has set. So that is an overview of managing the fire service training program. Uh, I'll turn this over to Chris now and see if there are any questions out there in the audience that we can answer quickly. Uh, if not, I thank you for attending today's presentation. Awesome. Thanks so much, Todd. Thank you for joining us for week, uh, I think it's four of our Managing Fire Service Training Webinar Series. Please be on the lookout for the remainder of the series and be sure to sign up for the continuing webinars. We would love the opportunity to work more closely with you to help you accomplish your training goals. Our system can help you provide your organization with training, tracking, and managing your fire service training program. So please head to cipherworks.com for more information. Be sure to save the certificate for your professional development records, and we look forward to seeing you in the future. Have a great day. Thanks, Todd. Thank you.